All right. Can you hear me? Terrific. So the AI doctor. So, and I've got my, um, well, this is vivid. Yeah, so I'm feeling very vivid right now. So, um, yeah, taking a red eye is not always the best thing. Um, but um, being in front of you is definitely um, uh, wakening me up, so I appreciate that. So how many people have heard of Jeopardy and Watson? Raise your hands. So, so you can imagine, as we thought about that challenge in Jeopardy and the, the issue of competing against two humans, we were not interested in just winning a game show. We were interested in the topic of healthcare. And that was one of the use cases. And I don't know if you saw, yesterday we also announced a partnership with Sesame Street and Elmo in and, and, and the area of learning as well and education. But what I'm going to talk about is this topic of healthcare. And I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. So as you think about technology, what is a ubiquitous, somewhat iconic form of technology that you think exists today in healthcare? Oh, geez, you already got it. That was so quick. The stethoscope. <laughs> so, 200 years ago, and actually studies have shown that if a doctor wears that stethoscope, you generally trust him or her more. So. <laughs> but in 1816, Dr. René Lenech, a French physician, was examining his patient, who was a bit overweight, trying to listen to her heart sounds with his ears. Could you imagine if you went to your doctor's office and they said, oh, I forgot my stethoscope. You gotta listen to your heart and lungs <laughs> with my ears. But then that was the form of listening to things like heart, lungs, and abdominal sounds. So at that time, he took 40 pieces of paper, rolled it up, and he created the first stethoscope as he was able to hear those lung sounds, those heart sounds. And so what I'm trying to articulate now is that this has and continues to be uh, a, a tool that doctors use. But as we look into the future in terms of technology, the role of a cognitive system like Watson will have extraordinary implications. And it will be as ubiquitous, as common as the stethoscope. So now I'm going to take you back to only like 15 years ago when I came out of residency and the challenges that I saw as I had my paper-based charts. So this is transitioning from being a resident where you've got maybe four patients in an afternoon on an outpatient setting. You've got a number of patients on the wards, but you've got a whole system that supports you. And you've got doctors, attendings, chiefs. And then you go into this outpatient setting in an underserved setting in Washington, D.C. And then you're faced with what I would consider a big data challenge. You've got all these charts. You've got all the textbooks that you, <laughs> you have there. And you've got the journals, the medical journals that you get every week. Maybe I got three or four. I got Lancet. I got New England Journal of Medicine. I got JAMA. And this whole idea that I'm seeing patients in that setting, and I've got all this data, loads of data in front of me. And it's humanly impossible for me to know everything in every one of those charts. And as a primary care physician, I had maybe 2,000 patients that I took care of. So to know everything about every single person was very challenging. And to know all the medical literature. And what would I get when I get that chart? I would typically get about 15 minutes per patient. And as we know, the science shows that half that time is spent documenting the visit. So I would have patients who some of them were limited English proficient, there was cross-cultural linguistic challenges. A lot of them were underserved. They had social determinants of health issues. I had seven or eight minutes to basically listen, learn, address, and support those issues, whether it's diabetes, whether it's arthritis, whether it's asthma, whether it's heart disease. And so part of what I'm trying to highlight here is that that, in many ways, is a big data challenge. And what I would get, typically, in terms of vital signs, is I'd get a heart rate a respiratory rate, a blood pressure, a temperature. And in many ways, if you think about that, those are basically vital signs to determine whether or not the person is very sick. They're tachycardic, their heart rate's racing. They're having problems breathing, their respiratory rate is fast. Their, high, you know, their blood pressure is too elevated. Or they've got a fever, and they likely are infectious for some reason. 
So you would come in with a chief complaint, you come in with these vital signs. And what I want to highlight now, and I just was in Bumagrad Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand, and I saw the power of this system, a system that understands reasons and learns, a cognitive system that addresses that big data challenge of all the stuff in the medical records, all the stuff in the medical literature, 200 textbooks, 300 journals, 12 million pages of text, and this ability at the point of care to help people with cancer, to help that oncologist make a treatment decision that combines all that knowledge that's humanly impossible for any doctor to know all the time, especially when they're limited with that time pressure of that 15 minute visit. So we see, I see a future where in the next 200 years, cognitive systems like Watson will be common in healthcare practice. And it'll be as common as the stethoscope. And so here is just an example. It was going through a case of a cancer patient and how Watson can quickly, at the point of care, translate what we typically know takes 17 years. Have you, has anyone ever heard how many years does it take to translate research to practice? It's about 17 years. So this ability to get all this knowledge, get all this data at the point of care, you can translate that 17 years into 17 seconds. And we're bringing this through the power of the cloud, through the ability for us to democratize access to this knowledge and expertise from Memorial Sloan Kettering oncologists to those oncologists in Bangkok, Thailand. So this is another chart I wanted to highlight here. So what is this chart? Do you guys know? What does it look like? It's got a lot of colors. It's a good measure of health. So life expectancy across the globe. So this is where life, now if you put this chart and we were in 1900, what would you see? Everything would likely be orange. Because in 100 years, we, developed countries like the UK, the US, have gained 30 years of life expectancy in 100 years. And how much of that is related to healthcare innovations? 30 years, 25 years, 20 years? How many people say 20 to 30 years is related to healthcare? Raise your hands. How many people think 11 to 20 years? How many people think zero to five years? You guys are all like right down the middle in all of them. So actually, three years of that 30 years is related to healthcare innovations. Things like vaccinations. Things, a lot of the things have to do with road traffic safety. It has to do with efforts around water safety, food safety. Um, there's a broad range of interventions that play a role. But the point I'm trying to make now is that the world is flat, it's small. And one of the most amazing things about IBM is the I in IBM, the international, the ability to see the globe, to see how health and disease is viewed differently across the world, and to recognize now, with the digitization of knowledge, this ability to basically put it on the cloud, we now have an ability, for the next 100 years, to make this whole map blue. But we're gonna make it sooner. We're probably going to make it in the next 20 years all blue because of our knowledge, our innovation, and that ability to connect the dots there. And what I'm going to articulate as well is IBM is committed, in terms of Watson Health, to a broad range of initiatives across the globe. I mentioned Bumagrad Hospital and cancer care. Calderdale, UK, we just had an initiative where we looked at uh, physical inactivity. So if you look in a place like the UK, you will see the same challenge. So just don't get the impression just because you know, your part of the map was blue, that there aren't parts in your community here that have wide disparities in life expectancy. 10, 15, even up to 20 years of life expectancy in your own community. And the, we had an initiative in Calderdale, UK, where we looked at the topic of physical inactivity. And we saw that Calderdale, UK had major issues in that area. And we looked at different, Watson looked at different notes from the social service notes, from youth, from the elderly, and it read through its natural language pro processing skills, those notes, to get insights, to translate that big data into an insight. And that is the key that I'm going to highlight now, is this ability for us to translate big data into big insights to the key policymakers, to the key researchers, to the doctors, to the citizens, to the different stakeholders who ultimately want 
the common goal of healthier populations with longer life expectancy. Okay, so this is one way I like to frame it, and, and the evidence varies, but one, two, three, four. So one of the things you learn during medical school is acronyms, and you learn a lot of ways to remember things. Unfortunately, you spend a lot of time memorizing, but with Watson, hopefully you won't need to memorize as much uh, with an augmented intelligence system to help the doctor. But basically, this is what the evidence shows in terms of determinants of health. And the UK has been a leader in this space in looking at the role of things like social determinants of health. 10% is healthcare, 20% is genomics, 30% is social and environmental. There was a reference you know, about, made about the importance of isolation and social connectedness in relationships. That's a very important part of health. And then 40% is behaviors. And so each of us as individuals will produce in our lifetime 300 million books worth of data. So it's the data that's on your wearable. It's the data that, as genomic testing becomes more prevalent, you know, related to that. It's the data in terms of the social and environmental determinants of health. And it's the healthcare data in your electronic medical records or in the images that are taken. Or it's, so this data, there's an opportunity now to translate it. And what I want to talk about, and this is Jonathan, is as a physician, I would come in, and Jonathan has hypertension and diabetes. He would come see me maybe once every three to four months. I would deal with the medicines in that 15 minute visit, seven or eight minutes interacting with him, asking him about how he's doing. He would bring me his diary of blood sugars or his, you know, and then we check his blood pressure. And that would be maybe amounting to one hour a year face to face with Jonathan in that exam room, in the walls of that clinic or that outpatient setting. And if you think about it, there's 8,760 hours in a year. So Jonathan would go out into the community, the communities that I was referencing before, where there's wide variability in life expectancy, dealing with all the other determinants of health, whether it's zip code or it's behaviors, food deserts, crime, unemployment, all these other factors that play a role, weather, and there's amazing studies that show a correlation of weather to things like asthma or even migraine headaches. There's all these other factors that exist out there that are typically in these siloed places. And the ability for us now to put all that data together, to deliver an insight, can really change that visit with Jonathan. Because now I would normally say, Jonathan, come back to me in three to four months. But the reality is, if Jonathan's doing fine, if his blood sugars are great, if his, high, if his blood pressure is great, if he's being active, doing the things he needs to do, maybe I don't need to see him in three to four months. Or maybe if he's not being active, maybe he's not moving, he's not sleeping well, his blood sugars are way out of control. Why isn't that data coming to me with his permission to give me an insight where I might nudge him? Why are we in a system that reacts more than being proactive? that can predict, that can personalize, and that could prevent these health outcomes that are frankly bankrupting many of our economies. So that is an extraordinary opportunity, this concept of thinking about all the data of determinants of health, looking at all these opportunities to connect the data, <coughs> instrument it, interconnect, and make it intelligent. So this brings me to this idea when we, the topic is AI doctor. It wasn't for artificial intelligence doctor. It isn't about replacing doctors. It is about augmenting or complementing. It's with the doctor. Because if you think about it, in that 15 minute visit, the role of the doctor, the role of the human, is in building the relationship. It's these skills that humans have, the compassion, the ability to abstract, to generalize, to have common sense, to have the morals. These are all key aspects, and technology should be used to help improve those relationships, not make them harder. I mean, how many of us have gone to a doctor where you feel like the doctor's talking to the computer and not to you, right? So we've got to realize that there are things that humans excel at in cognitive systems, this ability for immediate pattern identification, nat natural language processing, Locating knowledge, a recent study that occurred. And with this ability to have all that data now digitized, whether it's medical records, whether it's medical textbooks, whether it's journals, 
that can be done in seconds, 17 years into 17 seconds. And it never gets tired, like me. I'm a little tired now. <laughs> and it doesn't have a bias, which we all have as humans. So this is the ability to have an augmented intelligent doctor. It's about connecting these dots. And I like, once again, the simple way to remember this is you want a system that understands. Watson can read millions of pages in a second and understand the medical literature, understand the medical record, understand the language of medicine, which we've been focused on with experts. It could read both structured and unstructured data. If you look at a chart, if any of you have read your own chart, I mean, the doctor's right, there's certain structural elements to it, where the labs are, where the images are, where the chief complaint is, where the history of present illness is, where smoking status is. <laughs> but there are aspects of it where there's so much language there and imagine how Watson and Jeopardy had to read all that language and understand it. And now it understands the language of health and healthcare. It reasons. So it looks and searches, but it understands the nuances of, of language, but it also understands the evidence-based recommendations. It connects the dots. As I said before, it takes so many years. And actually, the studies show that even evidence-based guidelines, once they go through the whole process, only about half the time do you get what is evidence-based in practice. That's a big gap. And it learns. So once again, a system that continues to improve. So what it may recommend today may differ an hour from now or tomorrow. It continues to improve and learn. It needs, so URL is the way I remember it. Understand, reason, and learn. So as we talk about Watson and we talk about the cloud and this democratization of health information data in a, in a privacy protected space where this data is, is, is brought up there, where you translate the data into insights and you translate into solutions to help these different key stakeholders in the health and healthcare ecosystem. This is what we've created at Watson Health. And my last slide is because I think about, it, if you're at the table, I like, I like the analogy. What, what is it, um, if you're thinking about all the partners at health, at healthcare, what are you if you're not at the table? What are you usually? You're probably on the menu. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is, as we think about solutions, and this is a team effort. This is IBM being a catalyst. It's being a team player. And the team players that we've assembled, like Apple and Under Armour and Teva Pharmaceuticals and CVS Health and Novo Norisk and Johnson & Johnson, this is about a team effort and how we can challenge what is happening in healthcare, which is we've got all this data, and we need to translate it through a cognitive system like Watson into insights to all those key stakeholders, from patients to providers to life science companies to payers to employers to health and human services, and providing those insights at the right point of care, the right information at the right time to predict, to personalize, and to prevent bad outcomes and promote good outcomes. And that's what we're about. So this idea of the AI doctor is, as I suggested earlier, the fact that in the future, or now already it's happening, for the next 200 years, cognitive systems like Watson will be as ubiquitous as the stethoscope. Thank you very much.